Agora TV. The world is thinking. Um, I guess I should start by saying, my name is Tom, and I'm a documents fetishist, right? <laughs> and we can go from there. I filed my first Freedom of Information request in 1976 when I was a college dropout at the time, working for a little weekly newspaper in Minnesota. Now, how you get from Louisiana to Minnesota is another whole story. But there were a bunch of farmer protests against imminent domain seizure of their farmlands for a high-intensity power line. So I filed my first FOIA request, and I failed to get any documents. But I got a great story out of the filing of the FOIA request, and this should be a lesson to us all. Because I asked, well, if the farmer's all upset, let's file and get a copy of all the public health studies of the health consequences of exposure to high-intensity power lines. And I asked the several federal agencies who were involved, and all I got was no records responses. And when you followed up with interviews, it turned out there were no public health studies of large population exposure to high intensity power lines. And that was news because the government hadn't looked at it. Fast forward to the present, Michael Moss in the New York Times just won a Pulitzer Prize in explanatory journalism for tracing a single hamburger. I'm glad we're having sausage today and not, not burgers because once you read Michael's story, you never would eat another burger in your entire life. But what was fascinating, his FOIA request also failed. The documents came back blacked out about the specific grinding of hamburger at the cargo plant that put together the package that went and made this poor girl totally sick to the point of paralysis, right? It was blacked out. But using the blacked out documents, he went and found the inspectors, interviewed them, and filled in the blanks with a little bit of whistleblower, some good background, some good shoe leather reporting, fill in the blanks. The documents became a kind of a fixed point in a turning world, to use C.S. Eliot's phrase. And that's the enormous virtue of them. So if I could leave you with one, I mean, I'll tell some more stories. The National Security Archive today exists because a couple of reporters, Ray Bonner and Scott Armstrong, had used freedom of information requests to get so many documents that were stacked up in their kitchens that their spouses said to them, get the paper out of my kitchen or I'm leaving you. <laughs> and they started the National Security Archive as a family values institution to save their marriages. We've done 40,000 freedom of information requests since then. We just nailed Henry Kissinger on a 30-year-old uh, mystery about the warnings the U.S. tried to give before Orlando Letelier was blown up. And Kissinger, we now have the proof that he called off those warnings. Could have made a difference. Could have prevented some murders. Um, but I just want to leave you with one thought, which is um, every day we go into the archive, which is based at George Washington University, in a what I would call a documents state of mind. We look at practically any action in the public arena done by a corporation, done by a government agency. If the action took place and affected anybody, it will leave some kind of record. Now, people may try to destroy that record, but it will leave some kind of record. And our job is to go after it and get it, even when it takes years. And I'll leave you with one image. We found out a few years ago that the single most requested document in the entire archives of the United States of America was not copies of the Declaration of Independence, was not the Bill of Rights or the Constitution, was not the Gettysburg Address, was not JFK's inaugural, was not any of the documents we think of as historical. You know what it was? The photograph of Nixon and Elvis in the Oval. Exactly. <laughs> The photograph, that's what more people come to the National Archives to get a copy of than any other item or artifact in American history. Well, so we had a photograph, we had a date, we had a place, we had persona. Could have been a UFO, but you know, it was Elvis and Nixon. We said, we want all documents in any media related in whole or in part to the meeting between Elvis Presley and President Nixon on this date in the Oval Office. It took a few months, but we got back not only the handwritten letter from Elvis, saying, Dear Mr. President, I'd like to get a credentials as an honorary narc. Uh, this is great irony, considering how he died. I've got credentials from Shelby County, Tennessee. I want to get those federal badges, right? We got the, the briefing memo from the appointment secretary. Elvis showed up at the White House gate this morning wanting a, a meeting with the president. Now, you and I should try that sometime and see if it, it works. But uh, we might be able to get him to do a TV special uh, in our war on drugs, get high on life, that kind of thing. There's talking points for Nixon. Then there's what are we, the secretaries, what are we going to do with the 45 caliber pistol that Elvis brought in to give to the president? And hey, and you want those autographed photos? I don't think the president's family wants to take them away. And best of all, 
we got the, the outtakes, the B-roll of all the 40 other photographs than the iconic one. We got the photographs with them both looking bleary-eyed and hungover and barbiturally addled. We got the, the ones of the bodyguards standing around and then the, my favorite in the whole series, we had Nixon reaching over to Elvis's arm and taking his sleeve and gazing in awe and total admiration at the rhinestone cufflinks and wondering why didn't Pat give me anything like that, right? Anyway, this is what Freedom of Information Act can do.